it's Miss Christina here. I am going to be reading you chapter two of A Little Princess today. Chapter two, A French Lesson. When Sarah entered the schoolroom the next morning, everybody looked at her with wide, interested eyes. By that time, every pupil from Lavinia Herbert, who was nearly 13 and felt quite grown up, to Lottie Lay, who was only just four, and the baby of the school had heard a great deal about her. They knew very certainly that she was Miss Minchin's show pupil and was considered a credit to the establishment. One or two of them had even caught a glimpse before. Lavinia had managed to pass Sarah's room when the door was open and had seen Mariette opening a box which had arrived late from some shop. It was full of petticoats with lace frills on them, frills and frills. She whispered to her friend Jessie as she bent over her geography. I saw her shaking them out. I heard Miss Minchin say to Miss Amelia that her clothes were so grand that they were ridiculous for a child. My mamma says children should be dressed simply. She's got on one of those petticoats now. I saw it when she sat down. She has silk stockings on too, whispered Jessie, bending over her geography also. And what little feet. I never saw any such little feet. Oh, sniffed Lavinia spitefully. That's the way her slippers are made. My mom says that even big feet can be made to look small if you have a clever shoemaker. I don't think she's pretty at all. Her eyes are such a queer color. She isn't as pretty as other people are pretty, said Jessie, stealing a glance across the room. But she makes you want to look at her again. She has tremendously long eyelashes, but her eyes are almost green. Sarah was sitting quietly in her seat, waiting to be told what to do. She had been placed near Miss Minchin's desk. She was not at all abashed at the many pairs of eyes watching her. She was interested and looked back quietly at the children who looked at her. She wondered what they were thinking of, and if they liked Miss Minchin, and if they cared for their lessons, and if any of them had a papa at all like her own. She had had a long talk with Emily about her papa that morning. He's on the sea now, Emily, she had said. We must be very great friends to each other and tell each other things. Emily, look at me. You have the nicest eyes I ever saw, but I wish you could speak. She was a child full of imaginings and whimsical thoughts, and one of her fancies was that there was a great deal of comfort in even pretending that Emily was alive and really heard and understood. After Mariette had dressed her in her dark blue schoolroom frock and tied her hair in a dark blue ribbon, she went to Emily, who sat in a chair of her own and gave her a book. You can read that while I'm downstairs, she said, and seeing Mariette looking at her curiously, she spoke to her with a serious little face. What I believe about dolls, she said, is that they can do things we will not, they will not let us know about. Perhaps, really, Emily can read and talk and walk, but she'll only do it when people are out of the room. That's her secret. You see, if people knew that what dolls could do, they would make them work. So perhaps they have promised each other to keep it a secret. If you stay in the room, Emily will just sit there and stare. But if you go out, she'll begin to read, perhaps, or go and look out of the window. Then, if she heard either of us coming, she would just run back and jump into her chair and pretend she'd been there all the time. Comme elle est Mariette said to herself. And when she went downstairs, she told the head housemaid about it. But she'd already begun to like this odd little girl who had such an intelligent small face and such perfect manners. She had taken care of children before who were not so polite. Sarah was a very fine little person and had a gentle, appreciative way of saying, if you please, Mariette. Thank you, Mariette, which is very charming. Mariette told the head housemaid that she thanked her as if she were thinking a lady. She said. Indeed, she was very much pleased with the new little mistress and liked her place greatly. After Sarah had sat in her seat in the schoolroom for a few minutes, being looked at by the pupils, Miss Minchin rapped in a dignified manner upon her desk. Young ladies, she said, I wish to introduce you to your new companion. 
All the little girls rose in their places, and Sarah rose also. I shall expect you all to be very agreeable to Miss Smith, or to Miss Crew. She has come to us from a great distance, in fact, from India. As soon as your lessons are over, you must make each other's acquaintances. The pupils bowed ceremoniously, and Sarah made a little curtsy, and then they sat down and looked at each other again. Sarah, said Miss Minchin in her schoolroom manner, come here to me. She had taken a book from the desk and was turning over its leaves. Sarah went to her politely. As your papa has engaged a French maid for you, she began, I conclude that he wishes for you to make a special study of the French language. Sarah felt a little awkward. I, th I think he engaged her, she said, because he thought I would like her, Miss Minchin. I'm afraid, said Miss Minchin with a slightly sour smile. That you have been a very spoiled little girl and always imagine that things are done because you like them. My impression is your papa wished you to learn French. If Sarah had been older or less punctilious about being quite polite to people, she could have explained herself in very few words. But as it was, she felt a flush rising on her cheeks. Miss Minchin was a very severe and imposing person, and she seemed so absolutely sure that Sarah knew nothing whatsoever of French that she felt as if it were almost rude to correct her. But the truth was that Sarah could not remember the time when she had not seemed to know French. Her father had often spoken it to her when she had been a baby. Her mother had been a French woman, and Captain Crewe had loved her language. So it happened that Sarah had always heard and been familiar with it. I... I never really learned French, but... But... She began trying shyly to make herself clear. One of Miss Minchin's chief secret annoyances was that she herself did not speak French, and was desirous of concealing that irritating fact. She, therefore, had no intention of discussing the matter and laying herself open to innocent questioning by new little pupil. That is enough, she said with polite tartness. If you have not learned, you must begin at once. The French master, Monsieur de Fares, will be here in a few minutes. Take this book and look at it until he arrives. Sarah's cheeks felt warm. She went back to her seat and opened the book. She looked at the first page with, gray, with a grave face. She knew it would be rude to smile, but she was, and she was very determined to not be rude. But it was very odd to find herself expected to study a page which told her that la père meant the father and la mère meant the mother. Miss Minchin glanced toward her scrutinizingly. You look rather cross, Sarah, she said. I'm sorry you do not like the idea of learning French. I'm, I'm very fond of it, answered Sarah, thinking she would try again. But you must not say but when you are told to do things, said Miss Minchin. Look at your book again. And Sarah did so, and did not smile, even when she found that the fields meant the son and La Frere meant the brother. When Monsieur de Farge comes, she thought, I can make him understand. Monsieur de Farge arrived very shortly afterward. He was a very nice, intelligent, middle-aged Frenchman, and he looked interested when his eyes fell upon Sarah, trying politely to seem absorbed in her little book of phrases. Is this a new pupil for me, madame? He said to Miss Minchin. I hope that is my good fortune. Her papa, Captain Crewe, is very anxious that she should begin the language, but I'm afraid she has a childish prejudice against it. She does not seem to want to learn, said Miss Minchin. I am sorry of that, mademoiselle, he said kindly to Sarah. Perhaps, when we begin to study together, I may show you that is a charming tongue. Little Sarah rose in her seat. She was beginning to feel rather desperate, as if she were almost in disgrace. She looked up into Monsieur de Farge's face with her big green-gray eyes, and they were quite innocent and appealing. She began, or she knew that he would understand as soon as she spoke. She began to explain, quite simply, in pretty, fluent French. Madame had not understood. She had not learned French exactly, not out of books, but her papa and other people had always spoken it to her, and she had read it and written it, as she had read and written English. Her papa loved it, and she loved it because he did. Her dear mamma, who had died when she was born, had been French. She would be glad to learn anything that Monsieur would teach her, but 
What she had tried to explain to Madame was that she already knew the words in this book, and she held out the little book of phrases. When she began to speak, Miss Mitchin started quite violently and sat staring at her over her eyeglasses almost indignantly until she finished. Monsieur Defarge began to smile, and his smile was one of great pleasure. To hear this pretty, childish voice, speaking his own language so simply and charmingly, made him feel almost as if he were in his native land, which in dark, foggy days in London sometimes seemed worlds away. When she had finished, he took the phrase book from her with a look almost affectionate, but he spoke to Miss Minchin. Ah, oh, madame, he said. There is not much I can teach her. She has not learned French. She is French. Her accent is exquisite. You ought to have told me, exclaimed Miss Minchin, much mortified, turning on Sarah. I, I tried, said Sarah. I suppose I did not begin right. Miss Minchin knew she had tried, and that it had not been her fault when she was not allowed to explain. And when she saw the pupils had been listening and that Lavinia and Jessie were giggling behind their French grammars, she felt infuriated. Silence, young ladies, she said severely, rapping upon the desk. Silence at once. And she began from that minute to feel a rather grudge against her short pupil. That is the end of chapter two. Uh, in the same video, since that was a very short chapter, I am also going to read chapter three. So here we are. Chapter 3, Ermengarde. On that first morning, when Sarah sat at Miss Minchin's side, aware that the whole schoolroom was devoting itself to observing her, she had noticed very soon one little girl about her own age who looked at her very hard with a pair of light, rather dull blue eyes. She was a fat child who did not look as if she were in the least clever, but she had a good-naturedly pouting mouth. Her flaxen hair was braided in a tight pigtail and tied with a ribbon. She had pulled this pigtail around her neck and was biting the end of the ribbon, resting her elbows on the desk as she stared wonderingly at the new pupil. When Monsieur de Farge began to speak to Sarah, she looked a little frightened, and when Sarah stepped forward and, looking at him with the innocent appealing eyes, answered him without any warning in French, that little girl gave her a startled jump and grew quite red in her odd amazement. Having wept hopeless tears for weeks in her efforts to remember that Le Mere met the mother and Le Père met the father, when one spoke sensible English, it was almost too much for her suddenly to find herself listening to a child her own age, who seemed not only quite familiar with these words, but apparently knew any number of others, and could mix them up with verbs as if they were mere trifles. She stared so hard and bit the ribbon on her pigtail so fast that she attracted the attention of Miss Minchin, who, feeling extremely cross at the moment, immediately pounced upon her. Miss St. John, she exclaimed severely, what do you mean by such conduct? Remove your elbows. Take your ribbon out of your mouth. Sit up at once. Upon which Miss St. John gave another little jump, and when Lavinia and Jessie tittered, she became redder than ever so red indeed that she almost looked as if tears were coming into her poor, dull, childish eyes. And Sarah saw her, and was so sorry for her that she began to rather like her and want to be her friend. It was a way of hers always wanting to spring into any fray in which someone was made uncomfortable or unhappy. If Sarah had been a boy and lived centuries ago, her father used to say, she would have gone about the country with her sword drawn, rescuing and defending everyone in distress. She always wants to fight when she sees people in trouble. So she took a rather fancy to little Miss St. John and kept glancing towards her through the morning. She saw that lessons were no easy matter to her and that there was no danger of her ever being spoiled by being treated as a show pupil. Her French lesson was a pathetic thing. Her pronunciation made even Monsieur Defarge smile in spite of himself and Lavinia and Jessie and the more fortunate girls either giggled or looked at her in wondering disdain. But Sarah did not laugh. She tried to look as if she did not hear it when Miss St. John called Le Bon Bon, Li Bon Ping. She had a fine, hot little temper of her own that made her feel rather savage when she heard the titters and saw the poor, stupid, distressed child's face. It isn't funny, really, she said between her teeth as she bent over her book. They ought not to laugh. 
when lessons were over and the pupils gathered together in groups to talk. Sarah looked for Miss St. John, and finding her bundled rather disconsolately in a window seat, she walked over to her and spoke. She only said the kind of thing little girls always say to each other by way of beginning an acquaintance. But there was something nice and friendly about Sarah, and people always felt it. What's your name? she said. To explain Miss St. John's amazement, one must recall that a new pupil is, for a short time, a some, somewhat uncertain thing. And of this new pupil, the entire school had talked the night before until it fell asleep, quite exhausted by excitement and contradicting stories. A new pupil with a carriage and a pony and a maid and a voyage from India to discuss was not an ordinary acquaintance. My name's Ermengarde St. John, she answered. Mine's Sarah Crewe, said Sarah. Yours is very pretty. It sounds like a storybook name. Do you, do you like it? fluttered Ermengarde. I, I like yours. Miss St. John's chief trouble in life was that she had a clever father. Sometimes this seemed to her a dreadful calamity. If you have a father who knows everything, who speaks seven or eight languages, and has thousands of volumes which he has apparently learned by heart, he frequently expects you to be familiar with the contents of your lesson books at least, and it is not improbable that he will feel you ought to be able to remember a few incidents of history and write a French exercise. Ermengarde was, Ermengarde was a severe trial to Mr. St. John. He could not understand how a child of his could be a notably and unmistakably dull creature who never shone in anything. Good heavens, he had said more than once as he stared at her. There are times when I think she's as stupid as her Aunt Eliza. If her Aunt Eliza had been slow to learn and quick to forget a thing entirely when she had learned it, Ermengarde was strikingly like her. She was the monumental dunce of the school, and it could not be denied. She must be made to learn her father said to Miss Minchin. Consequently, Ermengarde had spent through the greater part of her life in disgrace or in tears. She learned things and forgot them, or if she remembered them, she did not understand them. So it was natural that, having made Sarah's acquaintance, she should sit and stare at her with profound admiration. You can speak French, can't you? She said respectfully. Sarah got on the window seat, which was a big, deep one, and tucking her feet up under her, sat with her hands clasped around her knees. I can speak it because I've heard it all my life, she said. You could speak it if you'd always heard it. Oh, no, I couldn't, said Ermengarde. I never could speak it. Why? inquired Sarah curiously. Ermengarde shook her head so that the pigtail wobbled. You heard me just now, she said. I'm always like that. I can't say the words. They're so queer. She paused a moment, then added with a touch of awe in her voice, You are clever, aren't you? Sarah looked out the window into the dingy square where the sparrows were hopping and twit twittering on the wet iron railings and the sooty branches of the trees. She reflected a few moments. She had heard it often said that she was clever, and she wondered if she was. And if she was, how it had happened? I don't know, she said. I can't tell. Then, seeing a mournful look on the chubby, round face, she gave a little laugh and changed the subject. Would you like to see Emily, she inquired. Who's Emily? Ermengarde asked, just as Miss Minchin had done. Come up to my room and see, said Sarah, holding out her hand. They jumped down from the window seat together and went upstairs. Is it true, Ermengarde whispered as they went through the hall, is it true that you have a playroom all to yourself? Yes, Sarah answered. Papa asked Miss Minchin to let me have one because, well, it was because when I play, I make up stories and tell them to myself and I don't like people to hear me. It spoils it if I think people listen. They had reached the passage leading to Sarah's room by this point and Ermengarde stopped short, staring, quite losing her breath. You make up stories, she gasped. Can you do that as, as well as speak French? Can you? Sarah looked at her in simple surprise. Why, anyone can make up things, she said. 
Have you never tried? She put her hand warningly on Ermengarde's. Let us go in very quietly to the door, she whispered. And when I, when I open it quite suddenly, perhaps may, we may catch her. She was half laughing, but there was a touch of mysterious hope in her eyes which fascinated Ermengarde. Though she had not the remotest idea of what it meant, or whom it was she wanted to catch, or why she wanted to catch her. Whatsoever she meant, Ermengarde was sure that it was something delightfully exciting. So, quite thrilled with expectation, she followed her on tiptoe along the passage. They made not the least noise until they reached the door. Then Sarah suddenly turned the handle and threw it wide open. Its opening revealed the room quite neat and quiet, a fire gently burning on the grate, and a wonderful doll sitting in a chair by it, apparently reading a book. Oh, she got back to her seat before we could see her, Sarah exclaimed. Of course, they always do. They're as quick as lightning. Ermengarde looked from her to the doll and back again. Can she walk? She asked breathlessly. Yes, answered Sarah. At least, I believe she can. At least, I pretend I believe she can. And that makes it seem as if it were true. Have you never pretended things? No, said Ermengarde. Never. I... Tell me about it. She was so bewitched by this odd new companion that she actually stared at Sarah instead of at Emily, notwithstanding that Emily was the most attractive doll person she had ever seen. Let us sit down, said Sarah, and I will tell you. It's so easy that when you begin, you can't stop. You just go on and on doing it always, and it's beautiful. Emily, you must listen. This is Ermengarde St. John, Emily. Ermengarde, this is Emily. Would you like to hold her? Oh, may I? said Ermengarde. May I really? She is beautiful. And Emily was put into her arms. Never in her dull, short life had Miss St. John dreamed of such an hour as the one that she spent with the queer new pupil before they heard the lunch bell ring and were obliged to go downstairs. Sarah sat on the hearth rug and told her strange things. She sat rather huddled up and her green eyes shone and her cheeks flushed. She told stories of the voyage and stories of India, but what fascinated Ermengarde the most was her fancy about the dolls who walked and talked and who could do anything they chose when the human beings were out of the room, but who must keep their powers a secret and so flew back to their places like lightning when people returned to the room. We couldn't do it, said Sarah seriously. You see, it's a kind of magic. Once, when she was relating the story of the search for Emily, Ermengarde saw her face suddenly change. A cloud seemed to pass over it and put out the light in her shining eyes. She drew her breath in so sharply that it made a funny, sad little sound, as if she were determined either to do or not to do something. Ermengarde had an idea that if she was like any other little girl, she might have suddenly burst out sobbing and crying, but she did not. Have you a, a pain? Ermengarde ventured. Yes, Sarah answered after a moment's silence, but it's not in my body. Then she added something in a low voice, which she tried to keep quite steady, and it was this. Do you love your father more than anything else in the whole world? Ermengarde's mouth fell open a little. She knew that it would be far from behaving like a respectable child that has left seminary to say that it never had occurred to you that you could love your father, that you would do anything desperate to avoid being left in his society for 10 minutes. She was indeed greatly embarrassed. I, I scarcely ever see him, she stammered. He's always in the library reading things. I love mine more than all the world 10 times over, Sarah said. That's what my pain is. He has gone away. She put her head quietly down on her little huddled up knees and sat very still for a few minutes. She's going to cry out loud, thought Ermengarde fearfully, but she did not. Her black locks tumbled about her ears and she sat still. Then she spoke without lifting up her head. I promised him I would bear it, she said, and I will. You have to bear things. Think of what soldiers bear. Papa is a soldier. 
If there was a war, he would have to bear marching and thirstiness and perhaps deep wounds. And he would never say a word, not one word. Ermengarde could only gaze at her, but she felt that she was beginning to adore her. She was so wonderful and different from everyone else. Presently, she lifted her face and shook back her black locks with a queer little smile. If I go on talking and talking, she said, and telling you about pretending things, I shall bear it better. You don't forget it, but you bear it better. Ermengarde did not know why a lump came into her throat, and her eyes felt as if tears were in them. Lavinia and Jessie are best friends, she said rather huskily. I wish we could be best friends. Would you have me for yours? You're clever and I'm the stupidest child in the school, but, oh, I do like you so. I'm glad of that, said Sarah. It makes you thankful when you're liked. Yes, we will be friends. And I'll tell you what, she said, a sudden gleam lightening up her face. I can help you with your French lessons. That is the end of chapter three. I will see you all soon.